Welcome to the Jack Weston MCAT Podcast with your host, Phil Hawkins. And Asai Calderon Muñiz. All right, another deep dive into another science topic. Um, we're kind of keep, keep going to keep going. I know we talked a lot about diabetes last week, um, which is a very medically relevant like thing that you're going to be dealing with like every day of your life going forward. With, there's a chance of that, at least, um, going into medicine. Um, today, we're going to talk about something that is definitely MCAT testable, but probably not as medically relevant um, as as diabetes, definitely not medically relevant as diabetes, which is insanely medically relevant. Um, but this is still something that gets tested on the MCAT all the time. And it's, it's one of those topics that has a little bit of like, I'm annoyed by this, but there's a little bit of like, uh, you know, kind of politics and stuff kind of behind that, but we're going to be talking about evolution today and kind of like what's going on with evolution. The MCAT does expect uh, students to know kind of like concepts behind this. And so we're going to, we're going to kind of like talk through a lot of stuff with uh, Darwin and evolution overall. And this is also just a really interesting topic. Um, as I and I were kind of talking about what, what should we talk about in this episode? And I'm like, I started like going, Oh, we could talk about this animal and this animal and this, this thing and this plant and this, this weird moth or this weird bird. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk about this, but we should talk, you know, kind of taking a step back, obviously Darwin, father of evolution. Um, and like, I, I think there's this important thing with like Darwinian fitness, right? Which is kind of what creates this process of natural selection, where um, if you have a trait that is more favorable, you're more likely to have offspring and those offspring are more likely to have those traits. And so over time, this kind of creates a scenario where species can kind of change and adjust over time. Um, but I do think it's really important when we talk about this Darwinian fitness, a lot of times people think Darwinian fitness, that means like actual fitness, right? Whoever's the strongest, the fastest, the whatever, you know, kind of like, you know, the most fit. Um, but Darwinian fitness is more about like reproduction than actual like muscles and tone and cardiovascular health and things like that. Um, and so like, this is, this is a pretty important thing because if there is a lion that is maybe weaker than the other lions, but this lion is sneakier and like gets in and like this male lion has sex with way more female lions, then that weaker lion has a higher Darwinian fitness. Like it has a higher, uh, probability of like passing on its offspring. And so it is, um, its genes are more likely to get passed down than actually the big, strong male lion who actually doesn't reproduce as much. Um, there's also a very interesting term that occasionally will come up on the MCAT. And this is Fisherian selection as in Fisher. Um, and I think it's named after somebody named Fisher, but there, there's actually some traits that you might have that might make it that might make you less likely to survive. But if those traits make you more likely to reproduce, then those traits will be selected for. Like your those traits will be more likely to be reproduced. And like the classic example of this is the peacock, right? Imagine you're a male peacock strutting around the forest. You got these giant, very pretty, but very unwieldy feathers, right? It turns out having like, you know, a, a tail feathers that stick up six feet in the air is probably not super useful for running from predators or hiding, right? Like it turns out it's pretty hard to hide when you're covered in fluorescent feathers. Um, but that male, male peacock with the, the brilliant plumage there, even though that plumage makes it harder to hide from predators, makes it harder to run from predators, that plumage makes you for lack of other words, sexier. Um, it makes you look good to the other, the other female peacocks there, I guess peahens, I think is what they're called. Um, and so as, as a result, you're more likely to reproduce. And so that's this kind of like weird scenario where this, this trait, which actually hurts your ability to survive actually increases your ability to reproduce. And so this kind of like creates this weird pressure towards even more brilliant plumage and even more like longer feathers. And so we see this a lot in some 
especially species that have like competitive mating, right? Um, you see this a lot in like some fish that are really brilliantly colored or things like um, like peacocks and things like that. And so that, that's a really interesting thing um, just kind of overall. Uh, I feel like there's so much to kind of like go into with that as well, but um, but that that's an important term to just understand that fisherian selection um, and make sure you want to make sure that you understand what that actually means. So this is just like not not a hundred percent related, but this was the image that was coming through my my mind. So I'm in Boston, right, and we have um, some very some very interesting wild turkeys that like to like to make themselves known, um, in, in the area. And, you know, obviously they're not, they're not, forgive me if any turkeys hear this, there's not, they're not as pretty as peacocks, (laughs) right? And they are very, um, they just very much get what they want. And so, you know, I suspect that confidence may be helpful in terms of reproduction, but the way that they confidently walk into the middle of the street, knowing mm-hmm. full well that you're not going to run them over, they will like come after you. So as you were talking about this, I'm just like trying to not picture the wild turkeys that love to roam the area when the weather is nice. So as the weather gets nicer, I'm just like, huh, going to see some turkeys. <laughs> I, I, I feel like that's a really good example of like fish area and selection because that like that extreme confidence and confrontation stuff does not help them when they're confronting a car. Exactly. But it does maybe make them more attractive to the, to the opposite sex. Um, something actually, there's another term and um, this just occurred to me because we were talking about the, the Turkey thing. And this is something I've seen on the MCAT actually. And so I'm glad to bring it up, but I don't think we planned on talking about this, but there's also something uh, called sexual dimorphism where the, like the male and the female look different. Right. And so we actually have that in humans, like men are larger and more muscular on average and women are generally shorter, but also have like breasts and like men don't. And so like, there's, there's changes in the shape and things. Um, but you see this with like lions, with the lion mane or like peacocks where the, the male have the brilliant plumage or even turkeys where they have the kind of like waddle and like they're just kind of like a little bit different looking. Now compare that to things like like penguins, right? The male and female, like it's really hard to tell apart or like Canadian geese or bald eagles. I don't know why they're all birds in my examples. <laughs> um, but like you look at something like deer, have antlers there's a sexual dimorphism there versus like dogs like there's not really like a male and female german shepherd don't look as different as like a male lion and a female lion um so in those species where we see that sexual dimorphism that also implies a more competitive mating thing so think about lions like the males will compete right? Peacocks, the males will compete like deer, like the males compete for like the herd. Um, And so we see a lot of that sexual dimorphism that generally tends to indicate a more competitive mating scenario compared to like Canadian geese, which tend to mate for life or penguins or bald eagles. And like, so there isn't as much competition in that case. Um, I do feel like that implies some very interesting things about humans because we do have sexual dimorphism. So maybe for us, it is a more competitive mating scene, um, which if anybody is single and on online dating, like, yep, totally super competitive. Um, though I, I think there's obviously something to be said for like, you know, long-term monogamy, which does exist in humans but there is also some competition going on which is a little bit a little bit different oh gosh (laughs) (laughs) phil i have a question so are birds your favorite animal like like generally speaking no probably not it's just that you know we talked to start talking about the peacock and then the turkey and i'm like all right well i'm just sticking to birds (laughs) um if you're in an area, I hear that bird watch like that is amenable to it. I hear bird watching is very fun. I personally haven't gone, but know a couple of uh, folks who have gone and really enjoy it. Okay, yeah. Sorry for that, y'all. But also, this is so this is so MCAT, so it works yeah. out. Um, so I guess kind of thinking along flying creatures, <laughs> um, the you can also have. So we we've talked about 
like just the, the way the animal presents themselves um, and reproduction, you can have in that like increasing their ability to, to reproduce right in the case of the tur- uh, not the turkeys, the peacocks. There we go. Um, but there are also pressures, right, that may limit a species ability to reproduce or like external pressures that are going to, you know, um, limit the reproduction of species or particular um, animals with certain traits, right? And so this can direct kind of the the way um, that evolution occurs and it might promote, you know, the the evolution of um, a part of a species with a particular trait, um, extremes of a particular trait, a more moderate version of a particular trait. And those are all different possibilities. So um, let's say that we have, let's say we have squirrels. We've, we've been talking a lot about some flying creatures. These are creatures in, in trees, right? But not always flying around. <laughs> Um, so if you have, like, let's say you have these squirrels and you have an animal that just really prefers to eat the larger squirrels because they have more meat on them, right? Um, those larger squirrels are not going to be reproducing, right? As often. And so what's going to happen is that the, the pressure is going to force the future populations of squirrels to essentially be smaller. And so it's going to direct that, um, that evolution in a directed fashion. Hence, we call that directional pressure, right? That pressure from this animal eating all the larger squirrels um, causes directional pressure and just produces smaller squirrels. Um, Let's say that there is the same animal and it's decided that the big squirrels are too much work, right? Um, It might work in the opposite direction. And so there might be larger squirrels. And now there's this separate animal that is like, well, I want the big ones, but they're kind of too much. And the little ones just don't have enough meat on them. So they go smack for the middle. So then the two extremes are going to be um, what are selected for, right? Because the the middle average one was selected against. And so um, that's going to be divergent uh, pressure. Now, let's say that, you know, you one of them, there's, there's two different predators, right? One eats the really big ones, one eats really small ones. Um, in that case, it's going to be stabilizing pressure and you're going to have that kind of intermediate um, coming into play. So I, I have decided that I wanted to grow little things in my home. And one of the little things that has started growing in my home are tomatoes. <laughs> so I have these tiny little tomatoes. Um, I currently have more tomatoes than what I can currently eat. And so I just... Um, if, if you are in video, just imagine little baby tomatoes, the size of your thumb. So I I have brought these little tomatoes to class today. (laughs) And so we have tomatoes of varying sizes. We have a very nice, you know, granted, these are mini tomatoes, but we have a very nice mini plump tomato. We have, you know, medium size for what I'm getting. And we have this tiny baby tomato. Um, the, you know, this would be an artificial way of doing the same thing. I can see what branches are giving me these really big plump tomatoes. And I might decide, I don't like the really big ones because then I feel like I have to cut them before I add them to something. So I don't want those. So I'm just going to trim the branches that have these really nice plump tomatoes. And so I've just exerted artificially, granted, a directional pressure, right? Um, I might decide, I kind of really like the middle ones, right? Um, the little ones, they're kind of too small and the big ones, I don't know, they take so much longer. So I kind of want the middle ones. So then maybe I'll trim the branches in a way that the middle ones get produced more often. And those are the ones that I'm getting. And so that's going to be a stabilizing pressure. Granted, this is artificial, right? But maybe I kind of just decide I want to eat a tomato. Yeah. And that's okay too. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, just eat them all, grow them all. There you go. <laughs> Um, I really like that the examples of like with the squirrels with like directional and stabilizing and divergent. And so like those are the kind of the three scenarios where you have like you're pushing it in a certain direction, like bigger or smaller um, or like you're stabilizing. I like the example like and to realize it doesn't have to all be predators, like maybe just the biggest squirrels get eaten and the smallest squirrels don't survive the winter because they're not big enough to like keep themselves warm. So then just the medium sized squirrels stay there. But I think the most interesting stuff is the divergent, right? Where if something just eats the middle size and then you have like some big squirrels and small squirrels, and sometimes the big squirrels will mate with each other. Sometimes the small squirrels will mate with each other, but sometimes they'll mate with in between, right? 
and if like a big squirrel and a small squirrel mate, you're more likely to end up with like a medium sized squirrel, but then those are going to get eaten. But the big squirrels, when they mate, mate, they make a bigger squirrel, like small squirrels mate, they make a smaller squirrel. And so if the middle ones keep getting eaten over and over and over and over, and then like, oh, it's mostly just big squirrels and mostly small squirrels. But then like the predator is like, oh, the, the size I like doesn't exist. So I'm going to start to eat some of the smaller of the biggest squirrels and the biggest of the smallest squirrels. And they kind of like pull out that. And like over time, this kind of like creates some, some this divergent pressure that pushes things farther and farther and farther apart. And over time, you can end up with things that are very different, right? And so this leads to speciation, like when you create different species. Um, and my favorite example of this is um, the hyrax. That's H-Y-R-A-X, which is a creature probably no one's heard of. Um, but they're, it's most closely related um like species is actually the elephant. And so I think everyone knows what an elephant is, but if I ask you like, what is the most closely related thing to an elephant? Most people would probably say like hippo, rhino, I don't know, something, <laughs> something big and kind of gray and my guess. bulky. Yeah. Um, but instead it's the hyrax, which is a, like, it looks like a gopher, right? It's like, it's like small enough to like, you could hold it in one hand. It digs holes in the ground. Um, it eats like tubers and roots and stuff. And it's, it's basically a gopher, um, except for a gopher that lives in Africa, I believe. But um, those two species are a product of this divergent evolution where something kept eating the middle stuff. And so the species kept getting farther and farther apart until all of a sudden what was one species is now two. And you end up with two kind of different breeds if that makes sense you also see this a lot with like you, you mentioned the artificial selection like basically anytime a human steps in we call it artificial instead of the natural selection um but you see this a ton with like foods like tomatoes and things like that um but also with like dogs uh i'm a big dog person um and i think most people know uh, about my dog millie um, but Millie's a great Dane and like, it's weird to think that a great Dane is the same species, like a, a canine as a Chihuahua <laughs> or a Pomeranian or a German shepherd or a beagle. Um, but we, what we've done here is we've just kept breeding the biggest dogs and they keep getting bigger. And then we take the biggest of those offspring and breed those together. And that gets bigger. And so eventually you end up with like some really big dogs and some really small dogs. Um, and so just kind of an interesting thing kind of over overall, like, uh, on that, like shorter timeline, we can actually see and do this. Like we can actively create this like speciation, um, as we like pull apart this, you know, one thing like wolves, we've like spread into like tons of different things. Um, I don't think we've talked about this on the genetics thing. Maybe we did. It's one of my favorite facts, but dogs have a slippery genome. And so they're more likely to have more mutations over time. And so that's one of the reasons that we can create the speciation instead of taking millions of years, it takes like thousands of years. Um, and that's because specifically dogs are prone to mutations. And so a new trait appears and you can breed that in like a lot faster than you would expect in just like nature overall. Um, but kind of an I would have remembered thing. if we talked about dogs having a slippery genome, because yeah. now I just picture a dog on a <laughs> slip and slide. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a super interesting thing because like cats don't have a slippery genome. So dogs are more likely to get mutations and how would we get the speciation, but they also um that also leads to cancer more often because they get mutations in their DNA. And so that's why dogs tend to not live as long as like cats. But there's also way more differences in the species of dogs than there are in the species of cats. Um, so those two factors are actually related to each other overall, which is interesting. <laughs> so there's also a little bit of, you know, kind of the opposite of this, where we have one species splitting into two, like elephant and hyrax from some, like, some, like, ancestor you can also end up with like two things that have very different ancestors that evolve like separately on their own paths to become very similar and we actually call this convergent evolution um there's a whole bunch of good examples of this as well but um probably one of the best 
examples of this is the sugar glider and the flying squirrel. Um, Both of these are things that are like the size of your hand. They climb trees. They have like skin that connects their front legs and the back legs. So they got kind of like, I don't know if you ever like see those, like the skydivers with the weird wing suits. Like that reminds me of that, yep. like the wing suits. Um, and so like the, both of these things, like climb a tree and then jump and then glide to the next tree. Um, but, and, and they look, they're fairly similar in terms of the niche that they fill and like, you know, what they eat and like they climb trees and like they seem very similar but they're not related hardly at all. Um, It turns out the sugar glider, which I think lives in Australia is a uh, marsupial. So it's actually way more closely related to like a kangaroo than, than like any other mammal, right? Like, you know, marsupials, things with pouches, like they're all related, but you know, outside of that, you have like the rest of the mammals, including squirrels. And so the flying squirrel is actually more related to a dog, (laughs) than it is a sugar glider. And like the sugar glider is more related to a kangaroo than it is related to the the flying squirrel. Um, But these things, like through their own separate pathways and through their own pressures have evolved to fill kind of similar niches and have similar kind of properties. Um, Another example that shows up sometimes with that is like dolphins and sharks. And like they're, I mean, they don't look super similar, but they both eat like kind of the same size fish. They're both about the same size. They both kind of like swim in like the same waters. They both like, you know, live in kind of the same things, but obviously like dolphins are mammals and sharks are fish. And so a dolphin is more related to an elephant (laughs) than, than it is a shark, but like, obviously they kind of fill similar niches there. Um, Yeah. As you were kind of like talking through this, I just want to say, if you've never seen a sugar glider, please look it up. They're so cute. Yeah, (laughs) I just saw one for for the first, not in person, obviously, but I just looked it up and saw one for the first time today. And I think what's really cool, and we were talking about this, was that you can kind of tell in the face that they that they probably aren't as related as they might otherwise seem, which is just like an interesting, just random, random, interesting thought, which might might point to their different, um, like their different backgrounds, despite kind of occupying a similar, a similar niche. But yeah, I feel like the sugar glider kind of looks like a, like a possum, which is also a marsupial and like, yeah, makes sense. Cause they're actually kind of related. They're more related than they are to the flying squirrels. Um, side note, flying squirrels live in North America. Most people don't like, I don't think I've ever seen a flying squirrel. I think they live farther North in like the Canadian, like Wisconsin, Minnesota area, but I definitely need to check that out. Um, Can our Canadians friends, please tell us if you've seen a a flying squirrel, (laughs) we would love to know. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like that's one of those things that if someone told me about a flying squirrel as a kid, like there's these squirrels with wings that fly from tree to tree. I'm like, that's a bat. Uh, (laughs) But um, yeah, no, turns out real things. Um, we actually did like a quick Google on like the flying squirrel stuff right before this. And we started like reading about like, there's some interesting, weird stuff. Like my new favorite fun fact is that if you shine an ultraviolet light on a, on any of the three species of flying squirrels in North America, they fluoresce pink. And that's not a true thing for any other squirrels. That is Definitely not something you need to know, but it is something that's pretty cool. Um, fluorescence is a topic in and of itself that is MCAT testable, but yeah. um, <laughs> specifically flying squirrels being fluorescent. I kind of want to like run around in the woods in Canada <laughs> with like a big ultraviolet light and just <laughs> see if there's giant pink things flying from tree to tree. Um, I would like to hope so. I'm I'm highly suspect you might just scare them off doing that but you know <laughs> maybe <laughs> It'd be really cool imagine maybe. catching one i'll do it at night and they'll all be glowing pink as they fly from tree to tree yeah um, capturing that on picture would be awesome yeah but so okay so you've mentioned this thing about wings right and like bats so what about wings of other animals yeah so that's this this like a lot of times, you know, convergent evolution, we think of things that are kind of filling similar niches, but what about things that just have 
like appendages that are the same, like wings, like bat wings and bird wings and bee wings. Like, do we, would we consider that to be like a convergent evolution? Like not really, right? Like, like convergent evolution is when they like two species evolve to like fill the same niche kind of overall. But what we would consider something like that would be like more of an analogous structure, right? Where the the wing of a bat and the wing of a bird and the wing of a bee, these are all appendages for flying, right? The wing of a flying squirrel and sugar glider, that's not actually like a wing. That's more just like a skin flap. Um, but like the other things that actually have wings, we'd consider those to be analogous structures. They're analogous to each other, right? Like an analogy, right? Like this thing is kind of like that thing, right? That would be an analogy. Like the bat wing and the bird wing are kind of similar and the bee wing, they're for flying. Um, and so this term analogous structure gets used all the time. And I think it's really important to differentiate that from homologous structure. And so all, once again, all of these terms are things that the MCAT will test you on. So like you need to be really crystal clear on the difference between these, but a homologous structure is when there, there's an ancestor that has, um, like that has kind of turned into two different traits going forward. So for example, like whatever the, the ancestor of the hyrax and the elephant is, like their nose turned into the trunk of the elephant and then just a weird, just regular, like gopher-ish nose on the hyrax. And so we would call those homologous structures because they have a same, they're, they're kind of the opposite of the convergent evolution where it's like, it's the same in the past, but it's, it's different now. Another example of that would be like the flipper of a dolphin and the hand of a person, right? Because they're, they're both like, they actually have the same bones in them. My brother's a zoologist and he loves talking about like comparative anatomy. Um, and so like going back and kind of like looking at like the a dolphin flipper, like they have metacarpals and they have, you know, kind of all of the, like the same muscles, they might be bigger or smaller and kind of like, you know, changing the shape of them, but they still exist there. And so, and that's because we have a similar ancestor to a dolphin because we are all mammals. And so there's a mammalian ancestor to us. And so you just want to be really clear on those three terms get kind of like mixed up a lot with like convergent evolution. So when two things separately come to fill the same niche, um, analogous structures, which are like structures, like body appendages and stuff that kind of like separately evolve to fill the same niche. Those two are kind of similar. And then the homologous structure is the opposite where you have a similar ancestor that evolves to do, do two different like things um, overall, like the, the hand of a person and the flipper of a dolphin. Like, I don't think a dolphin can like play the piano, but I also can't swim as fast as a dolphin. So there's, there's a trade-off. <laughs> those, those are the most important trade-offs. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So I also can't play the like... piano though. So, <laughs> uh, so I've lost on both counts. <laughs> that That's fair. That makes two of us. If anyone uh, wants to teach us the piano, yeah, <laughs> let us know. Um, I think this brings up the really, really cool idea of, okay, so what if there are two species that like they depend on one another, right? Like not just evolving at the same time, but like their evolution is, is in part related to one another. That brings up this really interesting question, right? And this idea ultimately of co-evolution, um, which is the idea that two species, you know, depend on one another, um, and evolve together. Um, and so, because I still have tomatoes in front of me and because I really like, am now craving some, some tomatoes. <laughs> it was a weird craving that I did not used to have before I started growing them. Um, think about like tomatoes. So for, for those of you that don't know, tomatoes actually have this little flower first. And then from the flower, once it's um, like pollinated, it actually develops, like start developing like the tomato bud and then grows and et cetera. But like they need to get pollinated, right? Like that pollen has to get moved around. And so they depend on bumblebees. Bumblebees are one of them, right? Um, so they have this, you know, symbiotic relationship. They're both depending on one another um, and they are helping one another. And so they're going to evolve together. This is a very like general relationship, right? This isn't the strongest version of coevolution you're going to see um, because there are other, you know, um, animals that can help with this, right? There are other flowers that bees are pollinating, et cetera. But it's kind of an idea that, you know, flowering plants and something that benefits from the plant, but also moves around the pollen is along this, along these lines. Um, 
some two other really cool and perhaps cooler examples uh, that we we just have been itching to talk about. I've been itching to talk about. Um, so the first is um, the Darwinian or Christmas orchid. And so this orchid has this really long spur where the nectar is. And so it's like, if you picture it, if you get the chance, look it up. It's so cool. Um, so it has this long spur where the nectar is. And so there's, you know, Darwin saw this was like, there has to be something like some species that can access this, right? Like there has to be, and didn't find, didn't actually find out what that species was, that moth until yeah. like 40 years later, which is a long time. Yeah. Um, and so, just to clarify, I feel like the spur, it, like when talking about it, it's long, it, like it doesn't really, like you got to look it up because it's not just like, oh, it's a long thing. No, it's like, 20 centimeters like it is it is like over a foot long it's it's huge is 20 centimeters over a foot i need to work on my conversion um i think it's, it's two between and a half per inch uh, so no so 25 inches would be okay so it's 20 to 30 centimeters so it's about a foot long at the the longest in there because 25 centimeters <laughs> would be 10 inches so 30 centimeters would be about yeah. a foot. <laughs> it's about a foot long and so like Darwin's like, there's got to be some creature with a beak or a nose or something that's a foot long that can get to that nectar because, because it, it's got to work with some species. Lo and behold, they eventually found one. Um, and it's this moth that has a, um, definitely going to mispronounce this, proboscis that is as long. It's like super long. And so it's just, it has to, there had to have been something to access it. And it's the one that it's the, that particular moth with that yeah. very long proboscis that can access that, that nectar in the very long spur of this one particular flower. Yeah. Um, it's so weird. I feel like if you look at that moth, I feel like it reminds me of a kite because it's like a regular size moth with yeah. like a foot long nose, which yeah. is like crazy. It's got like this <laughs> long string. I feel like I want to run and pull the, the moth into the air like a kite. I see that. I definitely see that. Um, now, I don't know about you, Phil, but do you feel like sometimes you just, you're constantly forgetting something? <laughs> Uh, hmm. hmm. E. Sherman, while we'll be laying, I thought, what's that? I can't remember the address. Uh, <laughs> So I, um, great amnesia. <laughs> I definitely have a tendency to forget things. And there's this very famous character in a very famous movie that has a tendency to forget things. I will give you guys two hints. This character is um, in a children's movie and they are blue. Just keep swimming. Yeah. <laughs> and now we've made it to Nemo. Yes. <laughs> Finding Nemo. All right. So not Dory, but the clownfish. So Nemo um, and the sea anemone. An ane anemone, <laughs> anemone. Yeah. Have this really cool, you know, co-evolution. They really depend on one another. So didn't know this, but the sea anemone is actually pretty nutritious. Like their tentacles are nutritious. And so um, fish will often try and eat the sea anemone. And the clownfish does not. And so the clownfish calls the sea anemone home. Um, they protect it from fish that would try to eat the sea anemone. Um, they actually clean the anem anemone <laughs> and <laughs> their waste is actually nutrition for the sea anemone. So if the clownfish is doing all this, what is the clownfish getting in return, right? Well, the clownfish is getting a home and they're also getting protection from fish that would otherwise try and attack it. Right. And so they have this relationship and they depend on on one another. And there actually aren't a lot of species of like um, anemone and, and like fish that have this kind of relationship. And so it's a tighter relationship. So it's somewhere between the tomatoes and the bumblebees and the Darwinian Christmas orchid and um, this moth. But they also have this really close relationship. And so that's why having both of them together is so important. Um but yes, your favorite, your favorite fish species, in case you didn't already have one, the clownfish is in, you know, a really important relationship with the sea an anemone. <laughs> yeah. I really like looking at coevolution. It's like trying to understand how species fit together. Um, but coevolution is kind of dangerous because if like, especially for like the orchid and the moth, if, if like the moth went extinct, the orchid's 
going extinct or vice versa, because yeah. they really only work together. Um, and so without the moth, there's nothing to spread the, the pollen of the orchid. And without the, the orchid, the moth is not going to be able to eat like regular food. Cause it's got, its nose is huge and it's weird. It's proboscis. Um, not, it's not actually a nose proboscis. Um, but there are some other interesting cases of this. And one of my, one of my favorite ones to talk about is the avocado. So the avocado is a weird plant, right? Like, don't get me wrong. Definitely do avocado toast, but, <laughs> um, like trying to imagine what kind of species, like most like seed bearing, uh, like fruits and veggies, like in order for them to get kind of spread, like, yeah, like tomatoes, something's got to eat it and then poop out the seeds somewhere else. Right. And so that's how like this, the plants move. Cause they don't just walk. Right. Um, and so most things with fruits, that's how they do that. Like there's other things with like dandelions, right. They have like the big puff ball and the seeds blow away in the wind, but an avocado is definitely not going to blow away in the wind. Right. Like that's a little bit different. On the other hand, what kind of thing is going to eat an avocado pit? And then like, that's huge, right? Like that's like, okay, it's somewhere in between like golf ball and like tennis ball size. Right. And like, that's, that's not a fun thing to swallow. Um, it turns out that there were things that did eat them. Um, the megafauna that used to exist in um, it, you know, kind of across North America, things like giant sloths and like mastodons and mammoths and like basically these giant mammals that were herbivores that would just kind of like eat these things. And so they would eat like an avocado, they eat the whole avocado and then they'd walk around and they'd poop out the seeds somewhere else. And that would grow into an avocado tree. Um, but, you know, the, the advent of mankind uh, with a lot of hunting of that megafauna, basically we caused the extinction of those. And so now all of a sudden the avocado can't survive with that. It can't spread. It can't, you know, like that kind of like spells doom for the avocado. Um, and like for a long time, actually the avocado populations were shrinking because they weren't able to spread the seeds. Um, until all of a sudden humans are like, you know what, this is pretty good. Like let's eat avocados. And so now the only reason that avocados survived in that case, that's one of the few examples of a co-evolution scenario where one thing died and the other thing survived. And it's because specifically humans farm them. Like if it weren't for humans, like taking seeds and planting them and farming and trying to create an avocado ranch, um, if it weren't for that avocados would go extinct. Um, and so it's one of those things that we're kind of like keeping avocados around when otherwise they would be going extinct because of the loss of the megafauna. Um, and so I always like to think about that as kind of like an interesting thing with like coevolution and how things kind of depend on each other. And generally when one goes down, the other one's going down, but not always. We will sometimes do a good thing and save avocados, um, which is good for all, all the millennials out there so that you can um hey, hey. spend all your People money on avocado eating avocados toast. avocados way before avocados to avocado toast <laughs> i yeah. grew up on that for breakfast lunch and dinner yeah. <laughs> but oh my gosh yes so i think it's really important that you know we've we've kept this like fun right um but you never know how the mk is going to test you on this they might be really fun and bring in avocados they might not um note that you don't have to be an expert on any of these things Right. Any of the specifics. I don't, I don't expect a student to know exactly. what a sugar glider is and what it looks like or a Hyrax or Darwin's orchid. Exactly. So you should have a general idea of what these are and you should have general examples and you'll see them as you're studying the same kind of examples repeat themselves over and over and over again. Right. The idea of like the whale flipper and the human hand or, you know, dolphin shark, like those keep coming up. And so those you should be familiar with. Um, but this is, you know, we're not telling you like, go learn every single species that may or may not have yes. been related to itself. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind, just so that this doesn't become overwhelming. Studying for the MCAT, yes, it's a lot of hard work and you guys are putting in so much time and effort and mental energy. You can still make some of it fun. Yeah. We're, we're firm believers in that. I do think that you should focus on kind of like the vocab terms relating to these things. Yeah. So just for fun, at the end of the episode, let's just kind of go through. You want to know what Darwinian fitness is. You want to know what fisherian selection is. 
You want to know about sexual dimorphism? You want to know about directional stabilizing and divergent pressures or selections, you know, kind of like pushing speciation, which is another term you need to know. Uh, Convergent evolution, analogous structures, homologous structures, and then coevolution. And so there's actually like a fair amount of vocab terms that we kind of went through there. Um, but you want to make sure that you know the difference between all of those and you have examples in your mind, because even though they're not going to test you on those examples, they're going to give you different examples. And if you have an example and you're kind of thinking about it in that way, that'll make it easier for you to recognize like, oh, that's just like my example of the hyrax and the elephant or the example of the moth and the orchid or the the giant sloth and the, and the avocado pit. Um, and so... I I do think having those examples is really useful. Um, Note that you probably aren't going to get tested on those examples exactly, but you do need to know all of those terms and how to use them.